All right, everybody. Welcome to today's live stream. Uh, today looks like a little bit of a red day and we have a lot of things to go over. So let's just jump right in. So the first thing, of course, we can see that uh, today is definitely a red day. I don't usually go over prices, but uh, it seems like that's uh, on the top of everybody's mind right now is these, these pullbacks and maybe a slight recovery. But uh, these days, this is normal. And we can just see if we go on down the list, I mean, the market cap is 1.43. I think we're going to hit 1. Uh, 1. 1.5 trillion, but we didn't hit that, of course, because things are just kind of coming back. And we can just see, go down the list, yeah, it's a lot of red, no big deal. I think we all know that because everybody's checking their portfolio like every five minutes or seconds or whatever. So why? Why is that going on? Well, first of all, not that I really care too much about that. I will just say that one of the reasons is because of this. Uh, the SEC looks like they decided yet again to not approve uh, any of the spot Bitcoin ETFs. Now, this was something that was floated by by a couple of experts, uh, Balchunas and I forget the other guy's names. Uh, and they said that, yeah, uh, during this, th this window time, the, uh, the BlackRock, the Fidelities, the ARCs, they can all be approved because we're not really going through any kind of like active feedback. And uh, they said this would happen potentially within seven to eight days. Today is the last day. And surprise, they didn't do it. So it always astounds me how people are like, oh, that's amazing. It didn't actually happen. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Do you think that really was going to happen? I'm still on the fence about this January one going up. But but here we are. And uh, that's what's happening. And of course, I think there's a little bit of pullback and people either get scared or they're taking profits or whatever else it is. And as a reminder, uh, I'm hoping that this actually gets approved so we can stop talking about it and I finally get it out of the way. I've been hearing about this since 2017. So this would be... Uh, uh, about it, about the time we should actually get this done. But there is one thing that I will say, and that is that we have final deadlines for BlackRock and Bitwise and VanEck and a host of other ones. But the first one and the final deadline for the for ARC is January 10th. I'm telling you right now, if they don't approve uh, ARC, 21 shares in ARC, they're not approving anybody else because it would I would be I would be hard pressed for ARC to, they, they, for them to say. Now nah, I'm not going to do it. And they, you know, approve everybody else. That'd be massive lawsuits, but we'll see what happens. And of course, with this, you have to understand that uh, these are just ETFs. This is the thing. But the, but the big question is, is this normal? Yes, this is very normal. And of course, if we take a look at, if you are here from 2021, uh, welcome. Welcome to uh, the volatility that is the crypto market. And just remember this, this is from 2016 to 2019. Actually, we're looking at mostly 2016 and 17. And we took a look at the big run up. Now, these are, uh, this is in the massive blow off top bull run. This is my first one. And it was quite a roller coaster ride. And, and people told me that was normal. And I'm like, is that normal? It seems so strange. But yes, this is actually what we went up to. And of course, you can see along these peaks and valleys, you've got pullbacks of 38%, 36, 29 to reach the promised land of all time highs. And what does that look like for this last one? Pretty much the same, except that this one, we had two double tops. And you can just see that, uh, I mean, yesterday we may have gone down like two or 3% for Bitcoin. I'm not for sure how much. And of course for alts, it may have gone like 10 or 11%. That's child's play. Wait till we get to this stuff. So if you're, uh, sweating it out and thinking to yourself, this, this is gonna be very tough. You're right. And that's why not a lot of people can do it. But I think if you're here now, you're not a tourist and I welcome you to into the clan of being the people that are actually veterans. So welcome to it. And then I will remind everybody about this. Uh, people will say, well, you know, this feels pretty good, especially class 2021, which I always think is, is kind of funny. But just remember that this is nowhere near where we should be or where we're going to be in the next year to two years. This is my favorite, one of my favorite websites, looking to bitcoin.com, 100% free except for the macro stuff. But just look, this is, if you're taking a look at the, um, the market value and the realized value, and then they, they take all the noise out with the Z-score, look how far up we are from the massive buy zone. It's nothing, it's nothing. So if you think like, uh, oh man, I missed the boat and I should have bought more, don't worry, you got time. And of course, we take a look at the pie cycle top. Again, these are one of the indicators I talk about in my video where I'm going to talk about uh, when I talk about selling 80% of my crypto. Pie cycle top is one of those ones that uh, can actually nail it. You take a look at the 111 day moving average and then they crossed over the 350 day moving average times two. And you can see that uh, retrospectively, it nailed it in 2017. We had a double top in 2013. 
And of course we had, in my personal opinion, we had a double top in 2021, which is kind of interesting because you have like a double top in 2013, a single top in 2017. You've had, in my opinion, a double top in 2021. So maybe this one will be the, the next blow off top, but you can just see that uh, just how far things are actually uh, moving apart or uh, the, the amount of space that we have. Let me pull this up. We got quite a ways to go before we hit any kind of tops. And then also, don't forget this little gem, uh, the rainbow price chart indicator. Let me blow this up so you can see it. This is a, is a, a reasonable indicator for tops. You can see it kind of missed the mark over here. And then of course, uh, 2017, it nailed it. And then 2021, not so great, but it does do a pretty damn good job about calling some lows. And look at this. If we just zoom this in to take a look, we're just barely above what they would consider a fire sale. And over here, there was a line that they didn't even know what the heck that was because things were getting so low. So again, if you think you missed anything, don't worry, you've got plenty of time. These are just discounts and these are normal as we call them uh, pullback. So let me know what you think about that in the comments section. And that'll take for, you know, for Bitcoin and it's going on. What about alts? What about alts? It's a great question. Gas fees. I never thought I'd be covering this, but here we go. Polygon. And be, before I, I, I move on, you have to understand that uh, I'm super biased. Uh, everything I talk about, I own. So uh, we're going to talk about uh, Polygon. We're going to talk about Near. We're going to talk about Sweat. We're going to talk about Alluvium. I own all these things. So don't be disillusioned like, oh, Rob's a great guy. He just talks about these random coins. No, no, no. That's not, that's not how it is. I own them. So Polygon, the gas fees spike a thousand percent. And when I read this to you, imagine what it would be like if Ethereum fees spiked a thousand percent. So here's what's going on. Gas fees in the Polygon network reach as high as 10 cents. <laughs> Let me read that again. Gas fees in the Poly Polygon network reach as high as 10 cents. That's not bad. I'll take that. I mean, it is a layer. It is a not a layer two, it's a side chain, but still, I mean, that's quite a bit. What the hell is going on? So here's what we got. Gas fees in Ethereum layer two polygon surged more than a thousand percent to reach a peak of 10. The spike could have been due to the launch of a new polygon based NFT collection. This is uh, Sandeep, uh, one of the co-founders of Polygon. He said, what's going on? He goes, uh, this is a lot. This is a pretty high uh, increase of the transaction fees. But he did say this, which is, I thought was quite interesting. Six million transactions in the last 24 hours. 170 transactions per second on average. Eh, all right. One million plus Matic burnt by the protocol. Oh, now we're talking. The chain works smoothly. Gas fees went crazy, but no reorganization, no blocks, no zero blocks, et cetera. So I got to tell you, hats off to the uh, Polygon team for getting through uh, what was quite a bit of a, uh, of a congestion as everything starts to, be, to uh, clamp down on Polygon. So it looks like if you're worried about Polygon, hey, it stayed up. Unlike some different cryptos, you can say what they are in the comment section. I won't uh, name them. And moving on. Reason for the uptick. But so that's what they they, they thought. Well, maybe it was, it was an uptick because of this NFT collection. But they did say the reason for the uptick in network activity and sudden spike in gas fees seems to be coming mainly from a frenzy of enthusiasm for minting the new POLS token. We'll get to that in a second. Dune Analytics data showed the rush of minting activity for polls polls, whatever, coincide with more than 102 million Matic. The polls token is built on a protocol dubbed PRC20, which operates similar to the Bitcoin ordinals derived BRC20 token standard. And of course, you don't know what, what ordinals are. It's essentially NFT collection on the, on the Bitcoin blockchain, which the Bitcoin maxis, most of them lost their head when this actually happened, but I thought it was a pretty good use case, but whatever. Uh, moving forward, though, only 8.7% of the total poll supply has been minted with just over 18,100 owners claim the token. And then, of course, gas fees have actually returned to normal levels at 882 8, 8, GUI. So here's the question I got uh, yesterday. No, two days ago. I couldn't do yesterday's stream because back would not allow me to do that. But this Matic to Polygon or Poll or Poll 2.0, Polygon 2.0 milestone. Poll contracts are live in Ethereum uh, mainnet. This was on October 25th, 2023. And people were asking me about, hey, do we have to swap? Do we have to swap? Do we have to swap? Well, this is directly from Polygon Technology. This is from their website, from their blog post. And the question is here, is there anything I need to do today as a Polygon, POS, Polygon, ZK EVM user, or Matic holder? Let me say that again. Is there anything I need to do today as a holder of Matic? 
The foundation says nothing, nothing. This upgrade does not change active systems under the Polygon POS or Polygon ZK EVM networks at this time. If something changes, I'll let you know. All existing contracts will function as previously designed. If you would like to join the governance process and give your input, you can join here and there's the forum. And that's pretty much it. So uh, I know there's a bunch of different uh, uh, websites out there and different pretty much scams saying you that you need to change it over right now. This is the information I have so far. Correct me in the comment section, but this is coming directly from the Polygon organization. You don't have to do anything. However, talking about that, and alt, let's talk about blockchain gaming. So uh, on this channel, I've been talking about it for a little bit of time, about how I think that the next evolution for uh, the crypto markets are going to pretty much blow up by uh, two different factors. One is AI and AI cryptos. And the second one will be Web3 and blockchain gaming. And it looks like, if you've watched anything lately, that they uh, that is true. Things are blowing up. But not on top of that, just the price. Because the price of the token is the price of the token. The real question you want to ask yourself is, who's using this stuff? Is it being used? Is this nonsense? Are people just leaving the dust? Well, here's a little bit of insight. Blockchain gaming hits 1 million daily unique active wallets milestone. This is from DAP Radar. So blockchain gaming reached 1 million uh, unique or daily unique active wallets, 33% of the month's industry activity. Which chains are doing it? Great question. Wax, crazy, remains the leading blockchain ecosystem for gaming activity with 406,030 daily unique active wallets. Celo, blockchain sees a 538% increase in its gaming activity this month. So if you hold Celo, I personally don't, then congratulations to you. Also, Alien Worlds is the most used gaming dApp, surpassing, this is crazy, 133,000 daily unique active wallets. All right. Yeah, sure. And then to, to continue on, blockchain gaming overview. Daily unique active wallets soars to an impressive 1 million, 16% increase in the previous month. Gaming stronghold is evident, commanding 30% of the industry's activity. So whatever. Here's the interesting stuff. Industry dominance by unique active wallets. You can see it's broken down by DeFi, games, NFT, and social. What do you notice? You notice there's a bunch of red. And it's dwarfing, not dwarfing, but it's outpacing uh, the other ones. And the red is games. Blue is DeFi, purple is NFTs, and this uh, orangey burgundy, I guess, is uh, social. And you can just see over time that games are doing pretty darn good. And uh, like I said before, I think this is where things are going. Because remember, uh, even if we have another pandemic, even if we go into some type of uh, black swan or bear market, people still need these tokens to play these games. Believe me, there's a lot more gamers out there, and I think, than, uh, than we realize. And the question then is, well, what's going to lead the charge? Well, as far as like dApps go, Near Protocol made a big leap, registering a 34% jump to turn 29,000 uh, unique active wallets. And then there's Scale, then Solana. Also a game called Pixels moved to Ronin Spurs, the surging unique active wallets. Pixel made a significant transition to Ronin Network. Catalyzer Monocle surged a number of UAWs. So that's great. Here's the question I always have is, well, who's, who's leading? If you go to dapradar.com, and again, what I'm looking for is the dapps themselves, and we're kind of blurring the lines between dapps and games, I understand, I get it, right? But if we take a look at which, who is building on these, these protocols, and what are the ones that have the biggest, as far as like unique active wallets? Well, the first one is KaiChain, and that's on Near. And it's a, it's a certain type of app, I haven't seen in America, Southeast Asia, uh, different parts uh, across the globe. And really what it is, it's like a shopping app. But it's built on Near. And they got a boatload of different uh, unique active wallets, 668,000. <laughs> That's a lot. And then the second one is Alien Worlds, which is built on Wax, like we just talked about, and BNB Chain. Alien Worlds, it's got a balance of 2 million. Like, that's great. And the unique active wallets, 121,000. If you don't know what uh, uh, Alien Worlds is, it's a, like a card based game. Looks something like this. I'm personally not a big gamer as far as like card game does for damn sure. But you know, this is what is taking place for gaming. Great, that's fantastic. So then we got that. And then of course, uh, Sweat Economy, of course, I gotta talk about it because I own it. But it is number three, and it's on near and Ethereum. Unique Active Wallets, 103,000. The balance is 170 million. Pixels, the one we were talking about, Unique Active Wallets is pretty high, almost 100,000 per day. And then just to, just to put that in perspective, PancakeSwap 
has 300 million as far as locked up. And it's got, for the unique active wallets, 63.92 uh, thousand unique active wallets. So that's what we have for gaming and for those pieces. Uh, links are all in the description if you want to check, take a peek. Now, real quick, I want to talk to you about the gaming industry as far as Alluvium. So Alluvium, remember that game I just showed you? This one right here, Alien Worlds. You know, it's just a car-based game. Fantastic, right? So Alluvium, what is always interesting to me about these games is I'm like, do you even have a working product? Because a lot of these things, they gave us a bunch of, of uh, promises and no one ever delivered, except these guys so far. Now, there's other different games out there, like a Pixels, like, you know, fill in the blanks. I'm not, a, you know, uh, big into all of them. But Alluvium is launching their game on the Epic Game Store, November 28th. First of all, uh, this is the game itself. Let me, this is not a really good, let's see, games. Let's go to Overworld. All right. So this is actual gameplay. It's not like a trailer or something like that. And this is what they have right here. So Epic, the Epic Game Store, if you're not familiar with Epic Games, they're the ones that, uh, this is the Epic Game Store itself. They're the ones that produced uh, Fortnite. You know, that was the uh, free-to-play game that uh, was the first free-to-play game to hit a billion dollars revenue in under a year. Yeah, those guys. So they're going to launch on Epic Games. And uh, the question you might have is, well, Rob, what about the token? Great question. It's down almost 4% like everything else. But the Alluvium token itself, over seven days, eh, still not too good. 14 days, all right, now we're talking. 30 days, all right, 40 cents. 90 days, eh, about the same. 180, eh, it's pretty damn good, right? But if we max out, this is where it looks way different. Check this out. Wow. This token used to be $1,800. And now it's... 80 bucks? Isn't that amazing how things just kind of go down during this, this time frame? But again, over the last 90 days, it's done pretty good. And as a matter of fact, uh, we talked to Kieran Warwick. Uh, this was on, when was this? September 26th. So we were talking to one of the co-founders of Alluvium back then. I was like, you know, I think I'll probably uh, invest into something like that. And uh, it worked out pretty well for me. Now, does that mean that everything can't crash tomorrow? No. They probably... Who knows what will actually happen? I have no idea. But as far as like the alluvium, they can stake it and all that great stuff. Now what I want to do is I actually interview the other co-founder, Grant Warwick. Because the question I had was this, is like, okay, how long have you guys been doing this? When is this, I mean, when is everything going to come out? And what does the token actually do? Because I don't understand exactly what's happening here. So this is about 10 minutes or so. Just take a listen to the interview and uh, we'll come back and we'll do a little Q&A and go from there. Up, up, up promised uh wanted to bring in somebody who would give us a little bit uh, deeper insight into what's going on with the alluvium thank gaming you. token grant warwick welcome to the show for the first first time thank you and you had my brother on a month ago oh yeah this guy okay. uh this uh <laughs> gentleman don't here. put it up don't that, put the image up please oh this guy yeah yeah right so anyhow so <laughs> oh, we had him so we had <laughs> It was, it's and everybody who's watching, yeah, everybody's watching the video, the link in the description for the, for the interview we did with, with Kieran. But Grant, I want to bring you on to really go a little bit deeper into the project itself, because I believe, we've been talking about this for over, probably about a year now. I believe yeah. that Web3 blockchain gaming is going to lead the next bull market. It'll be between this and AI. And this is why I got excited about it. But the thing is, I got to ask some questions. And the first one is this, Alluvium, you're a game. It's one of those rare Web3 games that actually has a working product and it's going live in two weeks on the Epic Game Store. So what did it take to get to this point? And then we'll go over a couple of things about uh, bridging Web2 to Web3, and then we'll get into the actual token and why we actually need it and what it actually does. So the first question, Grant, how think, did it take to get here? Look, it took a lot of ambition mm -hmm. from my brothers and I initially in that first week period, just thinking big which stems from our oldest brother, Kane, already being successful in the industry. We had a kind of mentality of he can do it, we can do it. And if, th if three of us are doing it versus him just by himself, we can do it better. And so from a very day one kind of point of view, we were very ambitious. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, we had Kane's success to kind of live through there and managed to secure enough funding to build out a really, really world-class team. And we pulled together our collective networking ability to get 
some of the best artists, developers, en engineers in the space to just start building out something absolutely massive. So the team being of a world-class standard, I'd say is number one. Second to that is we've had a very dedicated and passionate community that has managed to keep us relevant throughout this whole development cycle. You know, we have over 300,000 people across our social media platforms and Discord, and they're very, very passionate people who've been creating content around our product and our development, which has kept the team motivated. So there's kind of been a synergistic vibe where we have a great community, a great team, and through different ups and downs, we just feed off each other and somehow maybe a little bit of luck as well <laughs> i guess you could say or bad luck who knows at this stage it's taken a lot of it's taken a lot of hard work right and then to okay just to expand that real quick because this isn't like an overnight success because i think you guys started this in 2019 or 2020 am i wrong I, if you go back in time i would <laughs> say this is a pretty good definition for overnight success not warranted <laughs> overnight mm. success at the time we, and I've, I've said this in other AMAs, we, were, we didn't have a game and the whole industry was going absolutely crazy. Right. And it was very similar to Tulip Mania where it was all speculation and just so many projects mm -hmm. just talking about massive scopes and delivering crazy things. And I think you could pull Alluvium into that as well. And the only thing that really separated us was that we actually had a team that could pull it off but at the time how could you have proven that it was very the whole thing was wild so i don't think we are successful yet until we have a fun game but it just depends how you look at it because if you look at it from the crypto side of things we were successful pretty much overnight it's just wild yeah and then well and then that'll lead us into our next question in a bit but talk about your team because I hear a lot of people, they will offload the, some of the responsibilities for the creation of these, these different games to uh, different individuals or different groups. How big is your team right now that is actually putting this together? Because to me, I know nothing about creating games, absolutely zero. So mm -hmm. how many, what does your team look like and where do they come from and what kind of size are we looking at? We have a team of over 150 people from mm -hmm. over 27 different countries. The entire project throughout our development cycle, it was all done remotely outside of an Alluvium office we had in Sydney for a period of time, which, you know, we started when COVID was still around and people just got used to the idea of working from home. Yeah. So I feel like, you know, one of the things that, that there's, it was a double-edged sword where the type of work that game developers and artists who work on games do is better in a kind of work better when you can work to your own hours because it's very passion driven and mm -hmm. you can work really really hard and that nine to five mentality i just don't think suits game development in general and a lot of major studios force their teams to go through that and we were forced not to go through that because we, how are you going to hire 150 experts in Australia where the talent, where the talent pool right. just isn't there? We don't have AAA gaming studios in Australia. So we were forced to do things remotely. And it just also allowed us to just kind of have no restrictions. And one of the, we, we as brothers, we worked really hard early on and we were kind of just had my time zone would just interchange. I do mm -hmm. a, you know, 12, 14 hour day, but always sleep eight hours. And so I would wake up talking to one group of artists, go to sleep, wake up talking to a completely different time zone of artists. And then as the weeks roll by, you're interchanging while those artists as well are doing the same thing. So everyone was interacting with everyone at different time frames, And we kind of had this like steam engine where it just never stopped. It wasn't like nine to five, everyone's gone, it's empty and there's crickets in the workplace. There's yeah. just always something happening. And I think that provided a lot of motivation to just keep pushing as hard as we did. Got it. So, so talking about pushing, because you just mentioned that you said, well, you know, we were successful and, you know, for, for, the, for the token itself and things a little bit crazy in 2021. <laughs> that is true. 
However, you know, you guys, to me, you, like I said, you're one of those rare projects that actually have a working product and you guys are going to go live on the Epic store in a couple yep. of weeks. So yep. with that one, the, the, the question that I have is, okay, traditional gamers that are out there, the web two guys, uh, mm -hmm. they hate web three and blockchain gaming and NFT games, at least, I mean, in the U S I mean, we, we, we talked to Yatsu from Enmoca brand said it's a little bit different out there, but for the web tours out there, it is as simple. Is it as simple as just making a fun game that they want to play from then a crossover? And do we even care if they ever get it? And it really just matters like, look, here's the game, take it or leave it. So, uh, to answer the second part of the question, I personally 100% care if they get it because I always prefer people coming around to innovative ideas. Sure. Even if at first it's uh, like people didn't like seatbelts in cars at one point. There was legislation like uh, lobbying in place to kind of undo it and we're, you're lo we're losing rights and things like that. Mm -hmm. How, like in hindsight, how can you say a seatbelt is a bad thing for a car? So there's kind of like when you're developing a game and you're trying to prove to people that what you're doing is more than just making a fun game, then I think that absolutely matters. But still fundamentally, you're never going to prove it unless the game is fun and so that was what we focused on first and then the side quest is trying to get people to get it right to get the crypto element of the project and it's it's multifaceted it's it's you can't just jump into the crypto space and start developing games and just lose all the fundamentals of game development you have to first lay the foundation like a traditional gaming studio would and then innovate on top of that and with all of the scams and dodgy projects that we saw unfold yep. <clears throat> it really really made it an uphill battle and now we really have an uphill battle moving forward because i've personally seen youtube content come out on our project that has had very little research done into it kind of uh, intentionally generating that drama and buying into that viewership you're going to get hating on crypto projects and it's like you're not even doing research you're not understanding what we are doing and you're not understanding that we kind of get half of what you're saying we're humble about it enough to go you're right like a lot of this is shit to, mm. to put it harshly and like we get that just give us time to deliver on what we're saying and try and be a little bit open because not every single studio out there developing in the crypto space is rugging you, is developing a crappy project, has team members that are inexperienced. And now we're coming to a stage where I can see other projects also starting to deliver on things that they said they would, which is extremely exciting because you don't need thousands of these games to succeed. You just need a handful and maybe out of that handful, one really, really popular one that kind of just bypasses that threshold in, in mainstream, gives everyone else the bar to move towards. And we haven't hit that yet, but we're very close. I hope that we can be the one that does that in a couple of weeks because we're very excited about this release. And I could probably get into the, the nuance of why You'd have to be a bit of a gamer to understand it, but. Well, how about this, Grant? We'll leave it for the, the next one sure. itself. Let sure. <laughs> I figured, I figured. So this is. <laughs> Don't so, worry, I'll spare you. Thank you, thank you. So, but we'll have you back and we'll talk about it. But here's the thing, like, we're going to talk about the token itself. But again, like I said, like you guys have one of those products that actually is a working product. It's coming out on Epic mm -hmm. Store. But let's talk about the token itself, right? Because yep. when we take a look at, at the token, uh, Let's just say the question is this, because people are asking right now, what does the token do? Why do we need it? And what about this uh, topic called revenue distribution? I saw you uh, were on another channel uh, mm -hmm. over there. It's a Jesus Martinez, Classy Games, and you, you mentioned it. So let's just get into it. Let's talk about the token as far as the investment side of it. So for me, the token, the, to the token's two primary purposes are for decentralized governance and revenue distribution. Decentralized governance we've seen in other projects, similar to you know my, my oldest brother's token, Synthetics, where you're, uh, we as founders don't have that ultimate, ultimate say over core things that happen in, in our project, which was 
early on, the reason we were excited about that was because the traditional gaming industry has massive communities of followers who follow their games, who want sequels and spin-offs to go a certain way, but everything's held by the studio and it just doesn't. And they continue doing things the way their communities hate. They start alienating. You know, people are afraid to make those decisions to like pivot away from certain things. So by having a decentralized governance structure that is uh, foundational with our token, we've already started to see decisions made that I personally don't agree with, but I'm happy to follow through with because I do fundamentally agree with the idea of being decentralized. Right. And for me, that's exciting, but it's nowhere near as exciting as revenue distribution because I still remember the day I heard that concept being talked about, like three or four days after Kieran approached me when we started. And he was talking to a couple of uh, venture capitalist firms. And I think everyone was just spitballing ideas and winging out like what we wanted ILV to be. And then this idea of revenue distribution came around. And for me, as someone who isn't a crypto person, I'm not a DGEN, I'm just your average artist, wasn't investing in crypto my whole life. I don't have some backstory of being a crypto person. Heard that concept and was like, whoa, yeah. this is crazy. We would be the, this is different from all the other crypto projects as well. Like 100% revenue distribution proportionate to your stake in the token. If you are a 10% holder, you receive 10% of revenue distribution, which is just so much more revolutionary than a typical gaming studio where you have a board of directors and then investors and they're getting a tiny distribution of the company's profits. For us, 100% revenue distribution. And the only way that you could have ever implemented that in a modern international, internationally invested business or DAO or whatever you want to call what crypto companies have become could happen through that technology that crypto enables, being able to instantly, through a smart contract, redistribute revenue from the game. And I think that is probably the most exciting thing as an art, as one of, as the art director for two years on this project. I think that's more revolutionary than any of the art we've ever done. I think it's more revolutionary than any of the ideas I've seen in other crypto projects. And I'm, I'm really excited to see us get to the finish line and just see how that unfolds because it's, it's, it's an incredible concept. Yeah, let's see how it goes. And again, it's not like you guys just have, have one uh, stake in the fire. You guys mm -hmm. got uh, three, potentially four games coming yeah. out. Yeah. And it looks like you guys are going the right direction. So Grant, I think you've answered a lot of our questions in a very short thank amount you. of time. So I want to say thank you for stopping by. We, we appreciate it. Uh, thank you for having me. Appreciate oh, it. Oh, yeah. Yes, we'll have you on again. And then everybody who's watching at home, uh, there'll be a link in the description. You can check out Alluvium, the staking, and then, of course, uh, links to the token and stuff like that. And then we'll go from there. So, Grant, thanks again. Thank you. <sighs> All right. So hope they answered some questions. Actually, you know what? In, in all honesty, I want to say uh, thanks again uh, to Grant and Kieran for coming on and just explaining exactly what uh, Luvian is and uh, what's happening. But there was a couple of questions uh, that I saw, one of those from, from Meme. And uh, the question itself was, why is Alluvium, why was it, first of all, almost $1,100 and now it's $80 as opposed to, like, say, something like, uh, like Gala? And uh, th there's a question uh, for yourself. Really what it comes down to is market cap. Uh, and of course, circulating supply. So if we take a look at Alluvium itself, we can see that, uh, ba, 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 where is it? This is what's interesting. The circulating supply is only 6 million. The total supply is only 9.6 million. That's pretty damn low. So if you think about it, then there's a reason why it was so much. And uh, moving from there, you're like, hmm, maybe that's uh, quite interesting. Again, the lower the uh, total amount, of course, the easier it is to raise the market cap, as uh, opposed to, say, Gala Games, which if you're looking at their total supply, max is 50 billion and total right now is 28 billion. But the question then you also have to ask yourself is this, well, if Alluvium is that much and it's got this much and there's a circulating supply, what's the unlock schedule? It's a great question. And the answer is if you go to CoinGecko and click on tokenomics, you can see exactly the breakdown for the allocation. Then you can see like, you know, who's got what public investors, pu public investors, public investors, 
pre-seed and seed, that's definitely about 25, 30% or so. The team has 50, 15%, got to keep the lights on. Treasury, same type of thing. Gotta, we got to buy for things. The yield farming, that was uh, for the revenue distribution. And the in-game rewards as well, 10%. So you take a look at that, pretty interesting. And then this is the big thing. Who's dumping on me? You take a look at the supply schedule. We are right now in November 2023. There's not much really going on after this. So uh, this is uh, the supply schedule. You can find this on every different crypto that's out there. So great question. And that is it. So now, uh, I, guess the, I guess we started the Q&A already. But... That's it for today's news. If you like today's video, give it a thumbs up. Consider subscribing. Everything we talk about is time sensitive.